Hey Church fam, my name is May. Welcome to Church Online. The only time that I'm going to get to welcome you to church with a view. <laughs> it is my hope and prayer that despite us each being in our own separate homes, that we will draw closer to God as a community through this service. Uh, I hope that you have a good one. I think I might actually come back out here with a download and catch mine over here. Hello everyone. We are Suzanne and Alistair Buchanan, and we've been members of Jubilee for over 25 years. We're looking forward to meeting with you this morning. I have to say, however, I've really been enjoying online church, and I'm quite excited about the possibilities it presents for the future as well. Anyway, lots of love, everyone. Bye. For the Jubilee family, we are the Banzis. This is Gamba. And this is Mom. And we welcome you guys, and hope you guys enjoy today's service. We love and miss you guys and cannot wait to be able to worship with you soon. But in the meantime, please stay safe and bye. Bye. Hi everyone, we're the Leaf family from the morning and evening congregations in Observatory. I'm Craig. I'm Bronwyn. I'm Annie. I'm Kristen. We're so grateful to God and also our elders and leaders for helping us to do this all online. And as you can see, we have our very own live Skippy with us today. Enjoy, Enjoy the service. Hey guys, I'm Swillila from the Jubilee Club Congregation. I'm really looking forward to worshipping together again. Um, that's uh, been one thing that I've missed during this lockdown period, of feeling the Holy Spirit move. Um, that's, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, and I'm wishing you guys all the best. Uh, miss you guys, love you guys. Miss seeing your warm and beautiful faces. Cheers. Very good morning to you, Jubilee, and welcome to this morning's service. A very special and warm welcome to all visitors who are attending our service this morning. My name is Kelly Chibale. This is my wife, uh, Bertha, and we are part of the eldership team here at Jubilee Community Church. I love the, the phrase that we've coined in at Jubilee, which says, renewing Cape Town with the gospel. I just love the word, that the word has got courage, tremendous power. It is explosive. It is amazing. And this morning, I just want to invite you to be, come with an expectant heart that God will meet you at your very point of need. We are coming to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who answers prayer and has given us a weapon of prayer and praise. So come with a heart that is full of, of bountiful praise and the Lord will do amazing things in your life. Indeed. Um, as we enter into a time of worship together, I want to remind us what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said about the kind of worshipers that our Heavenly Father seeks. It's those who worship him in the truth and in spirit. And so I want to pray for us as we enter into a time of worship, but also as we get ministered to by the word. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give thanks to you for this moment that you've given us to come into your presence. As we enter into a time of worship, I pray for the empowering presence of your Holy Spirit that will truly worship you in truth and in spirit. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let him die to set us free, set us free, Lord. 
Lord, you broke the chains of slavery. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're the innocent lamb, you're the roaring lion. You're the king and the priest, you're the sinner's ransom. You restore beyond what we could fathom. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Should have been me. What they did to you on Calvary, Calvary, where you bled and died to set us free. Set us free. Lord, you broke the chains of slavery. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Should have been, should have been me. What they did to you on Calvary, Calvary, where you bled and died to set us free, set us free. Lord, you broke the chains of slavery. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. As your blood hit the ground of the earth, you had made all of creation would never be the same from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky oh lord we lift your name on high as your blood hit the ground of the earth you had made all of creation would never be the same from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky oh lord we lift your name on high as your blood hit the ground of the earth you have made all of creation would never be the same from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky oh lord we lift chains of slavery Jesus 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 should have been Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he lift the fun Jesus formed the bar, formed the bar, praise say now. The lift of an Jesus is formed the bar, formed the bar for me. The lift of an Jesus is formed the bar, formed the bar, praise say now. The lift of an Jesus is formed the bar. Het is wonderbaar, wonderbaar, 
Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are amazing, that you are incredible, that you are majestic. Thank you, Lord God, that we can come to you knowing that you meet each one of us at our very point of need. And I pray, Lord God, for every life that you change every heart, that you encourage, that you inspire. The Lord God, you do only what you can do. That isn't your word like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. That even as we come to your word, Lord God, come and do amazing things in our midst. We thank you and we honor you. We give our day to you, Lord God. We give this service to you. Won't you come and have your way in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Countries around the world have been in various stages of the lockdown. For the last uh, several weeks, we've had the privilege to receive updates from partner churches within the advanced family of churches that we're part of. Today, we have the privilege and honor to receive an update from our friends and colleagues in Wales. And so we're going to listen to the clip, and I'll see you on the other side. Hi, Advance family around the world. Greetings from Hope Church Rhonda and South Wales. And we hope you're all doing really, really well. Um, it's been a very strange season for us. We're about 100 days into lockdown with a few restrictions slowly beginning to lift. Um, as a family, it's, it's actually been um, a really fun season, a bit chaotic at times with our boys and church and our business to run all from our house. Um, but we've also been grateful for awesome times with our kids and also just a real strong sense that they're uh, growing in their childlike faith, which has been awesome for us. Um, the church, I think, is well. It's hard. We're longing to be together, um, particularly just thinking about uh, young believers and those on the fringes of church life uh, that we long to keep connected. Um, but overall, I think we're doing well. We're hoping that it won't be too long before we can be meeting together in some sort of form and some sort of way. Um, but we'd love to be praying for you to be praying for us as we're praying for you. Yeah, awesome. So three specific things we'd love you to pray for. Um, the first one, like Ben mentioned, would be for the fringe of church. We've got uh, a number of newer believers who haven't been kind of connected into church um, the church family for that long, haven't been been going to church and being disciples for a huge length of time. So that's obviously 
uh, challenging for them now they're kind of removed from the church family and um, so praying for them and also a lot of them uh, might be the only Christian in their home so they don't have a lot of encouragement and um, so please pray for the fringe uh, and the new believers um, secondly, please pray for wisdom as we kind of navigate how to do church and we transition through uh, coming out of the coronavirus season, uh, just for wisdom for the leadership as we kind of work out how we're going to run things and, and how that's going to look moving forwards. Uh, and then thirdly, we've just in the last couple of weeks launched online alpha. Um, so we've had some amazing times doing alpha face to face and seen incredible fruit doing that over the last couple of years. And so we've just launched online uh, and we'd love you to pray for uh, all the guys who are connected onto that who aren't yet believers, that they would uh, come to know the Lord during this time. Um, and that, yeah, we would see amazing fruit for the gospel uh, in doing Alpha Online. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much. We're praying for you uh, across the world. And we hope we'll get to see you sometime soon. Bye, guys. This morning, we have three main announcements. For the first one, I'm going to hand you over to Nathan and Skippy for an update on the Jubilee Kids Ministry. Over to you, Nathan. Welcome back to Jubilee Kids News. In the news this week, penguins. That's right, folks. Our partners in news, the BBC, have reported that 11 new emperor penguin colonies have been spotted from outer space. More impressive still, though, may be this amazing self-portrait done by Johnny Fraser's little penguin, Nightly Cucumber. As you know, we've been running a self-portrait competition at Jubilee. And kids, you will have to tune in to your weekly videos to find out who the winners are in your age groups. We did say right at the start though, that the oldest entrant would automatically be a winner. But what we didn't expect was the oldest entrant being the runaway winner of the whole competition. 72 years old and have a look at this folks. We can't wait to show you our beautiful montage of self portraits next week. But for this week, make sure you tune into your videos kids for the start of our lesson on Daniel. Well, that's it from us here at Jubilee Kids News. As always, I've been Nathan, that's been Skippy, you've been you, and most true of all, Jesus loves you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that update from the Jubilee Kids News Desk. Yeah, I just want to encourage you that the Equip series are starting this week, and the tracks that are running are parenting, uh, biblical steps to racial harmony, a Bible study in Zephaniah, and a practical course on growing in the Bible reading, prayer, and spiritual gifts. You've been, if you've been one of those people that have read the Bible for 10 minutes and you feel like you've read for 10 hours, can I encourage you to sign up? You won't regret. These are just amazing uh, tracks. And then on the 1st of September, we've got the preparing marriage course for couples planning to get married in the near future. So if you're one of those people that are serious in your relationship, can I encourage you to sign up on the Jubilee website and we to be run through the, the video conference call. But if things change, they will let you know whether you'll be able to meet in person. Over to Kelly. This is not an announcement. Um, it really is just an opportunity once again uh, from the eldership team um, to express our thanks and gratitude uh, for your faithful giving in your tithes and offerings. Over the last uh, uh, several weeks, we've been going through a series from the book of Ephesians. Last week, Doug Clothier um, preached on the relationship between children and the parents. This week, we have the privilege of listening from Carl Johnson, who will continue in the series from Ephesians, talking about relationships of a different kind. Kyle, over to you. Hi, Jubilee. Thanks for joining us today. As you know, we're continuing to work our way through the book of Ephesians. And as we've said many times before, in the second half of the letter, the focus in Ephesians shifts from what God has done for us to how we are to now live for him. So in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And again and again and again in the second half of this book, Paul will tell us that to be a Christian is to live a life of love and holiness. So in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love. In chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul says, Live as children of light. And in chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And so repeatedly making a call to live a life of holiness and love in general, uh, Paul then makes specific application to certain key areas of first century life. He makes specific application to marriage, to parenting, and finally to, surprisingly for us, the area of slavery. Now, although these verses are often used to speak about the Christian's relationship to work, and we will actually look at that next week when Lex preaches on these verses, today we're going to reflect on the issue of slavery itself. Because, of course, the obvious question we have when we come to this passage is why Paul doesn't argue for the abolition of slavery and so today, what we want to do is spend time thinking about the relationship between the gospel and slavery. And so we're going to begin, as we always do, with the reading of the passage. Brandon is going to be reading for us, so over to you, Brandon. Today's Bible reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, from verses 5 through to verse 9. Slaves and masters. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God with your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Thanks, Brandon. Now, this passage is a perfect example of how a superficial reading of the text can lead you to make the conclusion opposite to what is intended by Paul. If we're not careful, it's possible to read this passage and to think that Paul is somehow endorsing slavery or that Christianity is pro-slavery. I hope to show you in our time together how that conclusion is wrong. But as we approach this topic, it's important for us to all remember that this is not merely an academic discussion. No, this is a very personal discussion. In the words of Tabiti Anwabile, he says, we're not simply proffering opinions about historical curiosities when we ask these questions. We're asking a question about ourselves, about the church's understanding of her mission in the world, and about the path to reconciliation. This is a very important and personal issue that we need to think carefully about. And so as we consider this, we're going to move through it carefully and we're going to have to think very uh, uh, carefully about the ways in which the scripture speaks about slavery and about the way it's played out in history. And so because of the amount of material that the subject touches on, I'm going to arrange this sermon into three parts. Firstly, biblical clarity. Secondly, a historic testimony. And thirdly, personal devotion. We need to think about this theologically historically and personally. So let's begin with biblical clarity. The criticism that is made is that the Bible endorses slavery. Ephesians 6 tells slaves to obey their earthly masters and to serve them. And so people say, surely the Bible is pro-slavery. Well, it's important for us to be clear about why that criticism is wrong. And the reason it's wrong is that the Bible teaches us in the very first chapter that every human being is made in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, we read the following. God said, let us make mankind in our image. So God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In the very first chapter of the Bible, the point is clear. Human beings are immeasurably precious. They are valuable. They are dignified because humans are made in the very image of God. Now, everything else the Bible says about people from that point onwards, whether it's talking about marriage or parenting or even slavery, everything else the Bible says has to be understood in the light of Genesis 1. People are precious because they're made in the image of God. No other religion, no other worldview has so exalted a view of humanity as the Judeo-Christian heritage. So we need to have clarity regarding the doctrine of humanity. We are made in the image of God. Secondly, we need to have biblical clarity on how slaves get spoken of in the Bible. And one of the uh, things that we need to recognize is that when we see slave narratives in Scripture, they're consistently marked by two elements, empathy and elevation. In other words, the biblical narratives empathize with the plight of slaves and they elevate the status of slaves. Let's consider two examples from the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 16, we read the story of Hagar. Now, as you may know, the patriarch Abraham sleeps with Hagar, um, who was a slave girl of his wife, Sarah. Scholars point out that this story and this practice would have been perfectly respectable in other cultures of the ancient Near East. However, far from endorsing this practice, the biblical narrative condemns Abraham and Sarah for their behavior. You see, God had promised Abraham and Sarah descendants, but instead of trusting God, they take matters into their own hands and they use their power sinfully to get an heir through illegitimate means. When Hagar falls pregnant, she looks down on Sarah. Sarah responds by mistreating Hagar and Hagar flees. Now pause at this point in the story. Abraham and Sarah have sinfully used their power to take advantage of Hagar. They've treated Hagar as if she doesn't matter. They've treated Hagar as if she's invisible. And so far, as I've pointed out, scholars mention that this is fairly common practice in the ancient Near East. And so what happens next in the biblical narrative is truly remarkable. The God who makes promises to Abraham comes to the runaway slave, and he makes promises to her, promises that in fact mirror the promises given to Abraham himself. And in response to receiving promises, Hagar becomes the first person in the Bible to give God a name. This is what she says in Genesis 16, verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Notice then how this story empathizes with the victimhood of the slave. In a culture where Hagar would have been invisible, God sees her. And she sees that God sees her. And by giving God a name, she is elevated in the eyes of others. She receives promises. She gives God a name. How radically different from the surrounding culture. Abraham and Sarah get critiqued, while Hagar gets empathized with and elevated. The culture would have thought that the slave girl was invisible, but she sees that God sees her. Another slave narrative worth noting in the Old Testament, also in the book of Genesis, is that of Joseph, who was sold into slavery. You might be familiar with the story of Joseph. You'll know that he is also treated with empathy in the narrative. And more than just empathy, Joseph also eventually gets elevated, promoted by Pharaoh, and eventually becomes a ruler in Egypt. Empathy and elevation. This is a perspective on slavery that was genuinely different from the surrounding culture, and of course is entirely consistent with what we saw in Genesis 1, that every human being is precious and valuable because they are made in the image of God. So we need biblical clarity on our doctrine of humanity. 
We need biblical clarity on how these slave narratives empathize with and elevate the status of slaves. Thirdly, we need biblical clarity when it comes to understanding what's going on with slavery in the Old Testament. And the way to do that is to try and get an understanding of what he, the Hebrew word refers to when it talks of servants and slaves in the Old Testament. So let's do a brief word study on this. The word that's translated slave or servant in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word cheved. Uh, in the translation ring on the screen here, you'll see that this Hebrew word is typically translated as servant in the NIV. Well, over 60% of the time, the word is translated as servant. Uh, the second most common translation is the word official. And uh, lastly, coming in at around 7%, is the word slave. Now, the reason this Hebrew word is translated differently in different contexts has to do with what this word referred to in the ancient Near Eastern culture. Peter Williams, who is the uh, principal of Tyndale House and a lecturer in Hebrew at the University of Cambridge, says that this Hebrew word heved is not inherently negative, but it relates to work. The word identifies someone as dependent on someone else with whom they stand in some sort of relation. He says being a chevet could be a position of honor. It does imply subservience or subordination to some degree. Um, all subjects of Israel are servants of the king, and of course that's still true in any monarchy. The king himself was a servant of God, and so William says in the time of the Old Testament, in Israelite society, no one is free in that sense. Everyone is a heved, everyone is a servant, whether the citizens are sort of servants of the king or whether the king is a servant of God. Everyone is a servant of someone else. And so Williams argues that in Hebrew and in the culture of the ancient Near East, this word heved overlaps in meaning in a degree that isn't true of English today. Servant and slave in Israelite culture really overlapped a lot. In English today, when we say someone is a servant, we've distinguished that very clearly from the idea of someone being a slave, which is, of course, why the majority of the time the word is translated as servant in the Bible. But considering that helps us to recognize how different this institution that is regulated by the Old Testament was to later forms of slavery that took place in the Roman world and that took place in the New World or in the transatlantic slave institution. Peter Williams has put together the following table that actually helps us to see these differences very clearly. It's worth um, having a careful look at this table because what it does is highlight eight conditions that makes slavery in the Old Testament materially different from later expressions of slavery. So Williams looks at the categories of holiday, food, legal redress, sexual protection, kidnapping, chains, torture, and physical abuse. And if you look at the Old Testament column there, you'll see that servants and slaves in the Old Testament receive a holiday, they receive sufficient uh, provision of food, they have legal redress, and they are afforded sexual protection. Compare that to Roman slavery and New World slavery, and you'll see that it's completely the opposite, except under the area of holidays in the New World system. But slaves were treated horrifically under these other systems in a way that just simply wasn't true in the Old Testament. They were afforded all of these protections. Additionally, in the Old Testament, slaves were not, um, kidnapping was prohibited. Uh, slaves are not allowed to be put in chains, tortured, or physically abused, which, of course, was exactly the opposite in later systems of slavery. We don't have time to go into detail in each category, but I do want to just go into a little bit more detail under one of those categories, and that's the category of kidnapping. Now, the Old Testament explicitly prohibits kidnapping. In Exodus 21, verse 16, we read, Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death. The prohibition on kidnapping couldn't be stronger. In the Old Testament, it receives the death penalty. And that command is repeated by the Apostle Paul 
when he speaks about the law in the New Testament. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10, Paul says that the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, for slave traders and liars. We've got to be absolutely clear about this. The Bible denounces, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, any form of kidnapping or selling people uh, as slaves or trading in slavery. The Bible absolutely denounces the kind of slavery that happened in the course of European expansion and African colonization. It is important for us to be crystal clear on this. However, even though the type of slavery regulated by the Old Testament was far more humane than later systems, it is still critiqued and undermined by the Bible. And that critique only gets more pronounced as Scripture develops. In fact, as we come into the New Testament, this approach of empathizing and elevating slaves and thereby undermining slavery only becomes more radical. We don't have the time to do a survey of the New Testament teaching on this. I want to look at one final example with you in the New Testament, and that is the example of Philemon. Now, in the letter to Philemon, Paul is writing to a slave owner, who is Philemon, about his runaway slave, Onesimus, whom Paul is sending back to Philemon. Now, for some people, this letter seems to prove that the Bible endorses slavery. Well, you can only have that opinion if you don't actually read the letter. Because when you read this letter, you come across the most radical language written about slaves that I think in the end fundamentally changes the way the world thinks about slavery. So what does Paul say in this letter to Philemon? I'd encourage you to go and read it for yourself. But let me highlight a few things Paul says here. Firstly, he says that Onesimus the slave is his child in the faith. You see, slaves in Greco-Roman slavery were not seen as sons. They were seen as property. But by describing himself as Onesimus' spiritual father, Paul establishes a profound link between himself as an apostle and Onesimus the slave. He says they are in the same family. Absolutely remarkable language for the ancient world. Secondly, Paul describes Onesimus in verse 12 as my very heart. These are words of affection that exceed any other description in all of Paul's writings. He does not use this language for Timothy, for Luke, for any of his uh, other friends or co-workers. Onesimus stands above all of them when Paul describes him as his very heart. Thirdly, Paul tells Philemon that he's to think of Onesimus not as a slave, but as a brother. Words that inspired the lyrics of my favorite Christmas carol, which said, Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Finally, Paul says to Philemon, Receive Onesimus, treat Onesimus as you would treat me. If I'm your partner in the faith, then treat Onesimus as you would treat me. It's hard for us from this cultural distance to appreciate how radical and dignifying Paul's comments are. Historians have pointed out how classical civilization lacked the concept of human dignity. There is no philosophy in antiquity that regarded humans as universally worthy. Neither the Greeks nor the Romans thought that people had today what we call human rights. And so when Paul describes this runaway slave as his son, as his very heart, as his brother, and as his partner, he is doing something groundbreaking in the social thought of the ancient world. Paul is saying to Philemon, your culture might tell you that Onesimus is a slave. Your culture might tell you that he is your property, but I want you to think of him as precious. I want you to think of him as my son. I want you to think of him as your brother. And more than that, I want you to treat him in exactly the same way that you would treat me. Regardless of his social status, he is your equal. He is your brother. He is your partner. The criticism is that somehow the Bible condones or endorses slavery. The reality 
is that the Bible establishes the worth of every single human being because it says that every person is created in the image of God. Every single person is fundamentally precious and dignified in God's sight. The biblical perspective on the human person destroys the foundation upon which slavery is built. Now, people might say, okay, maybe the Bible doesn't endorse slavery, but I really wish the Bible would be more direct in its attack on slavery. I want to conclude this point by helping you consider an illustration that might help you think about the way the Bible attacks slavery. The Bible attacks the concept of slavery in the same way that a depth charge attacks a submarine. Now, take a look at this picture with me. A depth charge, as you may know, uh, is an underwater bomb that is set to explode at sort of pre-selected depths. And the purpose of a depth charge was to destroy a submarine. Uh, I'm told that these have been replaced by torpedoes in more recent days. Um, but the idea um, of a depth charge is that even if the depth charge didn't actually hit the submarine itself, it would create shock waves in the water so that the water would be transformed into a hostile environment for a submarine. Although the depth charge itself would not destroy the submarine, the water gets weaponized by the depth charge and destroys the submarine. Now, in this illustration, the concept of slavery would be this submarine. The water would be the conscience of society. And the depth charge is the biblical teaching on humanity made in the image of God precious. When this depth charge goes off in the ancient world, it introduces ideas about human dignity that had never before been understood or articulated. And in the end, the biblical teaching on the doctrine of humanity creates a depth charge that results in the abolition of slavery. And to consider how that actually happened in history, we move from our first point to our second point, from biblical clarity to historic testimony. Now, of course, I'm unable to cover 2,000 years of history in uh, just a few minutes, so I want to make one simple point, and I'm going to give two historical examples. The simple point is this, that Christianity has provided the moral resources that have historically led to the abolition of slavery. The moral resources to critique, subvert, and ultimately abolish slavery have come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. This point could be summarized in the words of Martin Luther King, who said, deeply rooted in our religious heritage is the conviction that every man is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. Our Judeo-Christian tradition refers to this inherent dignity of man in the biblical term, the image of God. The two examples I want to look at are Gregory of Nyssa and John Newton. Gregory of Nyssa was a fourth century Greek church father. He lived in the first age of Christian legitimacy. In other words, before Gregory's era, Christianity was outlawed. It was a minority persecuted religion in the Roman Empire. And before Gregory of Nyssa, historian Kyle Harper notes that there are no extant criticisms of slavery as an institution in the entire ancient world. Slavery was considered as a fact of life. In other words, Gregory is the first person in history to argue for the fundamental injustice of the institution of slavery. He is the world's first abolitionist. Harper says that Gregory's logic, even his rhetoric, presages the ideology of abolitionism more than a millennium before it would come of age. And what was the basis for Gregory's attack on slavery? It was the belief that people were made in the image of God. This is what he said in a sermon on Ecclesiastes. He said, how many obols for the image of God? How many staters did you get for selling the God-formed man? Obols and staters refer to Greek currency and Roman coins. And Gregory's point is very simple. 
He says that the value of a human being is so precious, you can't put a price on it. Human life is priceless. You cannot, therefore, buy or sell anyone. In fact, Gregory would go on in the sermon to say that slaveholding was actually an expression of pride. He said, when someone turns the property of God into his own property and arrogates dominion to his own kind so as to think himself the owner of men and women, what is he doing but overstepping his own nature through pride, regarding himself as something different from his subordinates? He facetiously quotes the attitude of a slave owner and says, I got me slaves and slave girls. What do you mean you condemn man to slavery when his nature is free? Gregory is the first person to argue that human nature is fundamentally free. This is remarkable in antiquity. You see, some people, some philosophers would have argued you can be free if you're a certain citizen. You know, if you're a citizen perhaps of ancient Athens or Rome, then you can be free. But Gregory is the first person to argue that by nature you are born free. This is something we cherish today, that people by nature, regardless of who they are, are born free. Harper says that Gregory of Nyssa's comments emerge into the social thought of late antiquity as a light switch going off in a dark room. Gregory of Nyssa is not just following the logic and the conclusions of Stoic philosophers. It is a radical departure from Stoic thought. It is like a light switch going off in a dark room. So in the life and writings of Gregory of Nyssa, another moral depth charge is set off, and the aftershocks will powerfully reverberate into the years ahead, so that large-scale Christian abolitionism starts to take hold in the seventh century, and Harper writes, over time, the Christianization of Europe effectively eliminated slavery. Now, the tragedy, of course, is that despite that elimination of slavery in time, the practice of slavery returned. And from 1562 until 1807, European expansion included a horrific return to the practice of slavery. And that leads us to our second character. If Gregory shows us the pioneering role Christianity played in abolitionism, well, then John Newton gives us a more complex picture because Newton is a picture of both complicity in slavery as well as repentance of slavery. You may know that John Newton was the author of perhaps the world's most famous hymn, Amazing Grace. And Newton was involved in the African slave trade. He had been at sea since the age of 11. He worked on slave trips, uh, slave ships, um, engaged in many uh, slave trading uh, practices for many years. And after a number of dramatic experiences, Newton was converted to Christ as an adult. Later in life, as an Anglican minister, Newton uh, developed profound and deep regrets regarding his involvement in the slave trade, and he joined in the work of abolitionists. In 1788, Newton published a pamphlet entitled Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. You can get a hold of this online. You can find it in collected works of John Newton. Listen to how he begins. He says, If my testimony should not be necessary or serviceable, Yet perhaps I am bound in conscience to take shame to myself by a public confession, which, however sincere, comes too late to prevent or repair the misery and mischief to which I have formerly been accessory. I hope it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I once was an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. This pamphlet is a powerful and shocking description of the evils of the slave trade and the barbarity of the English towards Africans. Newton describes in graphic detail just what took place on these slave ships. Every member of Parliament in Britain was given a copy of this pamphlet, and it sold so quickly that it required reprinting. Newton was uh, challenging British policies on the slave trade. And regarding British policies, this is what Newton argued in this document. He said, the best human policy is that which is connected with a reverential regard to Almighty God, the supreme governor of the earth. 
Every plan which aims at the welfare of a nation in defiance of his authority and laws, however apparently wise, will prove to be essentially defected and if persisted in ruinous. The righteous Lord loveth righteousness, and he has engaged to plead the cause and vindicate the wrongs of the oppressed. It is righteousness that exalteth a nation, and wickedness is the present reproach, and will sooner or later, unless repentance intervene, prove the ruin of any people. I'd encourage you to read this pamphlet. It is, it is shocking, the kinds of practices that existed in the African slave trade. As a result of this, Newton was invited to give verbal testimony to a select committee of the House of Commons on the African slave trade and its brutality. And it is here in this verbal testimony where Newton unburdens himself and accounts without reserve the vicious cruelty inflicted on Africans by the British. And so Newton delivers from his pulpit, from his pamphlet, and to Parliament a death blow, says one biographer, a death blow to the slave industry from which it will not recover. It would take a further 19 years, but slavery would be abolished in Britain and eventually abolitionism would spread around the world. Of course, the response of the church to slavery over the last 2,000 years is far more complicated than either of these figures represent. We see much more complicity uh, of Christians in slavery in the American story as well as in the story of South Africa. Time doesn't permit us to explore those in any detail. The point I want to make, though, is that again and again and again, the biblical view of humanity's worth, the idea that every Life matters. Every individual is made in the image of God. Has been the doctrine that keeps fighting back against oppression and injustice. It's profoundly moving to me that this biblical vision was so clearly, ident so clearly identified by our own great leader, Nelson Mandela, who when celebrating Easter, in 1994 said, Easter is a festival of human solidarity because it celebrates the fulfillment of the good news, the good news born by our risen Messiah who chose not one race, who chose not one country, who chose not one language, who chose not one tribe, who chose all of humankind. You see, in an ocean full of submarines of injustice, the Christian tradition has been unleashing depth charges for 2,000 years. Not always consistently, certainly not perfectly, certainly there's lots to repent of, but again and again and again, whether it was Gregory of Nyssa, Thomas Aquinas, John Newton, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, or Nelson Mandela, the trumpet blast has been consistent. People are precious because they are made in the image of God. People of all tribes and languages can be redeemed by Jesus the Messiah and most hauntingly perhaps of all to the conscience of the oppressors, God the righteous judge will judge those who mistreat people made in his image. This is the cultural and the theological inheritance that Martin Luther King was talking about. Every human being is priceless. Every human being is valuable because they are made in the image of God. I want to conclude these two points by reflecting with you on the implications of this. You see, this isn't just the historic testimony of the church. This needs to be our testimony today. This needs to be our belief and our practice today that every person matters. Every life, born and unborn, matters. What would it look like for us both as individuals and as a church, to live out the full implications of this? What would it look like in our day as we engage the big issues facing us? Gender-based violence, racism, abortion. What would it look like at that macro level to engage with these things? What would it look like at the micro level to engage with those things in our homes, at work, in our neighborhoods, in our communities? 
we believe that every single human being is made in the image of God. And that just isn't our historic testimony. That needs to be our present testimony. So we need to think theologically and historically. Finally, we need to think personally. And the final point is personal devotion. One of the surprising things the Bible does with this topic is it uses slavery as a metaphor to talk about personal devotion to God. The Apostle Paul, for example, regularly calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ. And the reason Paul uses this metaphor is to indicate that he belongs to God, that he is devoted to God. Paul doesn't just use this metaphor for himself. Paul uses this metaphor for all Christians. And paradoxically, in Paul's writings, he says that every Christian is both absolutely free as well as a slave to Christ. We are free, Paul says, from sin. We are free from Satan. We are free from death. We are free from these things. But now we belong to Jesus. We have come under his rule in our lives. If we are Christians, Paul says, Jesus is our master. Jesus is our Lord. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. The Greek word for slave is doulos. He is the kurios. We are the doulos. He is the master. We are the servant. And as we saw in our passage in Ephesians 6, this is true for everyone. This is the huge subversion of slavery that is true in our passage in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. We are all servants of Jesus, regardless of where you are on any kind of social hierarchy. In Jesus, we are equal. In Jesus, we are united. In Jesus, we are all servants of God. We are all completely devoted to our master and our king. Mary Harris, in his, um, in his uh, theological reflection on this metaphor, says that the slavery metaphor refers to three elements in the devotion of a Christian to Jesus. He says it refers to our humble submission to Jesus. It refers to our unquestioning obedience to Jesus. And it refers to our exclusive preoccupation with pleasing Jesus. Here are a few verses which show us just how prevalent this metaphor is. In Romans 14, verse 8, Paul says, If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, Those who cleanse themselves will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. You see, if you're a Christian, you belong to God. You're prepared to do any good work because in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, Paul says, Our goal is to please him. That's my goal in life, is to please God, to honor him, to... As Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, to discern what pleases him. It's worth remembering that as Christians, we have the best master of all. He is gentle and lowly in heart. He is gracious and kind. But more radically than that, our master became a slave so that he could set us free. In Philippians chapter 2, we read the following about Jesus. Jesus being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christians have been set free. We've been set free from slavery to sin so that we might embrace slavery to righteousness a slavery in which true freedom reaches its fulfillment as we serve the one who first served us. And so as we conclude, can I encourage you to reflect on this metaphor that expresses total devotion to Jesus Christ? Does this describe your relationship to God? Do you see yourself as belonging to Jesus? Do you see yourself as prepared to do the good works he's called you to do? Is your goal to please him? These are searching questions as we reflect on our daily lives and habits, how we spend our time and money, 
Do we belong to Jesus? Are we employed in his service? If you're investigating Christianity, can I encourage you to consider Jesus? He offers a form of service that is truly free. And he is the only master who ever became a slave to set his servants free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect upon this weighty topic, um, we're amazed again at your word. We rejoice in the truth of your word, which speaks to our dignity as image bearers. We thank you for the compassion you have for victims of injustice. We thank you for the historic testimony of Christians who stood up for that, who worked on behalf of the oppressed. And we pray that in our own day, Lord, you would help us to do the same. As we look around our own society, won't you help us to discern what it might mean for us to have a present testimony of standing up for the oppressed And Father, as we reflect on this metaphor of personal devotion, we pray that we would be devoted to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We want to say again, Lord Jesus, we belong to you. We are committed to serving you. We recognize our sinfulness and selfishness, our imperfections and how we do that. We pray for your forgiveness and we pray for your empowering that we might truly be your servants who honor you and glorify you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the best master of all, that you are the master who died to set us free. Won't you help us to honor you with our lives? Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Carl, for serving us uh, so well. The message that Carl was preaching may be a challenging message to, to some of us. But I want to appeal to you and remind you of what the Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The bottom line of the message in these two verses is that we are made in the image of God. God said, let's make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So as far as God is concerned, We're all equal before him. And remember this, God is love. And the two greatest commandments speak about love. The first commandment speaks about obeying our God with all our strength, with all our minds, with all our souls, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we love our neighbor, if we practice love, we're not going to enslave anybody. And so I encourage you, as we look forward to the coming week, that we reflect on this personally, that we walk in love. Thank you for attending today's service. Have a blessed week. And see you next week. Bye-bye.